Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are Drs. Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Have you ever heard that pregnancy is a stress test? What does that mean? Today, we're going to discuss a couple of conditions that can come up in pregnancy that mean you might be at a higher risk down the road of being affected by chronic diseases. But not to fear, we're also going to give you some health tips and tricks that you can start to practice to decrease this risk. So let's think of pregnancy as an early warning system. There are so many changes that occur in pregnancy, some that we see, some that we feel, and some that occur within our bodies that we may not be aware of. Today, we are specifically going to talk about two such things. First of all, gestational diabetes, and second, a group of signs and symptoms that we call hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. These, if they present in pregnancy, they may indicate that you're at a higher risk of high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack and stroke, later on in your life. Now, if you want to go back and review what gestational diabetes and high blood pressure in pregnancy are and what they mean during your pregnancy, make sure you check out these episodes, episode number 88, Hypertensive Disorders of Pregnancy, and Episode 42, Gestational Diabetes in Pregnancy. We also did an amazing podcast with Noelle from At Nourish Beginnings Pregnancy. It's Episode 89, GDM Tips and Tricks from a Dietitian. And Noelle has an amazing course on nutrition in pregnancy. And if you're wanting more information, we highly recommend you check out her very affordable and very informative course. We'll make sure we link it in the show notes below. And we'll also link the discount that she generously has given our listeners. So now that you've come to terms with having had or currently having one of these two health issues during pregnancy, let's discuss what it can mean for your future health. Now, the ongoing screening and management of both of these groups of diagnoses are very similar, so we're going to treat them as a group. Let's start with gestational diabetes. As we discuss in our gestational diabetes in pregnancy podcast, it's caused when our pancreas cannot keep up with the insulin needs of our cells to properly manage sugar loads. As you can imagine, if your body's unable to manage this now, this is a signal that as the years progress, your pancreas may not be able to keep up with the insulin requirements long-term, leading to what is known as insulin resistance, when it takes more and more insulin to do the work as it used to. At some point, your pancreas is no longer able to produce enough insulin to get the sugar in your blood into your cells and your blood sugar levels start to creep up. This is what happens in type 2 diabetes. So what's the actual risk of developing type 2 diabetes if you had gestational diabetes in pregnancy? Believe it or not, it's about seven times higher than if you did not. Most of the studies looking at this have different follow-up times, some one year after pregnancy, which will obviously have a lower rate, and some have been quite long, which would have a higher rate of getting type 2 diabetes if you're waiting longer in life. It's estimated that between 20 to 50% of people who were diagnosed with gestational diabetes in pregnancy will go on to develop type 2 diabetes at some point in their life. Now, let's move on to hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This is a bit of a bigger group of issues, and we'll quickly go over what each of them are. You are considered to have had hypertensive disorders of pregnancy if you experience any of the following pregnancy complications. Number one, and the most obvious, is high blood pressure in pregnancy, and this includes both preeclampsia and eclampsia. Generally speaking, we define high blood pressure as greater than 140 over 90 on at least three occasions. Number two, intrauterine growth restriction. This is when you have a much smaller than expected baby. So this is defined as below the 10th percentile for weight for all babies at the same gestational age. So your baby would be smaller than 90% of the other babies out there who are around the same time in pregnancy. So a moderate IUGR would be from the 3rd to the 10th percentile, 
and a severe IUGR baby would be less than the third percentile, so smaller than 97% of babies at the same gestational age. The more affected your baby is from IUGR, the higher risk to you long-term, and we'll go into this a little bit later. Number three is placental abruption. So this is when your placenta separates from your uterus before your baby is delivered. Number four is idiopathic preterm delivery. So this is when your baby is born before 37 weeks of gestation or three weeks before your due date, and there is no obvious reasons for it. So sometimes we know why you have preterm delivery. So these reasons might be you have a multiple pregnancy like twin or triplets, you have a different shape to your uterus, such as a bicornuate uterus or a septum in your uterus. Sometimes it's for cervical incompetency, so your cervix just can't stay long and closed enough to keep your baby in the uterus, or for reasons such as placenta previa. These are all known reasons to have delivered a baby early, but sometimes we just don't have an answer why you went into labor early, and these are the cases that we call idiopathic preterm delivery. So we're also going to include gestational diabetes in this group as well, because we know people with type 2 diabetes have a higher rate of cardiovascular disease than those without. Now, there are some other risk factors that increase your risk of long-term cardiovascular disease that are not necessarily pregnancy-related, such as pre-existing high blood pressure or high blood pressure before you got pregnant, known type 1 or type 2 diabetes, kidney disease that was affecting you before pregnancy, to name a few. And the recommendations that we discuss in this podcast still apply to you, so keep on listening. So now that we've defined hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, let's look at how these different issues increase risk to your long-term health. We approximate about 20% of pregnancies being affected with at least one of these issues. This is a big chunk of our population. Now, the data out there is not perfect, but what we know so far is that compared to a person who had a pregnancy that was not affected with this group of complications, someone who has had one or more of these complications, so hypertensive disorders of pregnancy that Alicia clearly outlined above, good job, buddy. Thank you. Three to four times increased risk of developing long-term high blood pressure. Four. Point point two. Two. It's very precise. It's very precise. I was looking at that number. 4.2% the risk of developing heart failure, meaning your heart is no longer able to work effectively as a pump. Double the risk of having a stroke. 5 to 12 times the risk of having kidney failure. Two times or double the risk of having an atrial arrhythmia, like atrial fibrillation, where your heart sort of flutters instead of beating rhythmically. And double the risk of having coronary artery disease, which can lead to a heart attack. We also know that cardiovascular disease is quickly becoming the leading cause of death worldwide. And even though women tend to have a lower chance of having cardiovascular disease, we actually have a higher risk of poor outcomes of death if we do have it. And don't even let us begin to get into why this is. But it's just because all the studies were done on men, right? Oh, I can't even go there. We have different ways that we present with different symptoms, and that can be part of the cause, and that can sometimes go unrecognized. And it's complicated, and it sounds unusual, but it is true. So now that we've thoroughly scared you, (laughs) let's talk about how this can be an opportunity to look at how you can actually help your older self by making some really important changes right now. So this is the positive part of the podcast. Yeah, totally. Now, we're all well aware of how complex our health is and that there are so many factors that impact how our body moves forward in life. Some of these are social. For instance, we know that having a history of trauma increases your risk for cardiovascular disease long term. There's a great book, actually, if anybody is interested. It calls The Body Keeps Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. It's by Bessel van der Kolk, and we'll link it in the show notes below. But you can also find it on our Amazon page. And if you want to try to listen to it, Audible is a great one. And we actually have a link to uh, a free Audible trial. So if you're interested in just trying out Audible and you want to listen to this book, we'll link that in the show notes below. But certainly we recognize that none of this is easy and we can't change our past, but we can change how we move through forward into our future. So here are some suggestions of how you can decrease your long-term risk moving forward. I feel like we should be playing the Rocky soundtrack in the background. Oh, that would be good. Dun, 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 dun. Is this pain I'm feeling in my pelvis normal? Should I do genetic testing for chromosomal differences in my baby? Is it safe to go to the dentist while I'm pregnant? Doctors and maternity specialists Sarah and Alicia are here to empower you with even more knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. Presenting the Pregnancy to Parenthood podcast, a new series of informative episodes geared week by week toward whatever trimester of pregnancy you're in. 
Tune in weekly, following along relevant topics as we move through pregnancy, or just binge listen and come back to the episodes you found most helpful. Access the full series for a full two years and listen to it on your own time. To learn more, go to www.shefoundhealth.ca or click the link below. Okay, let's hear it. So number one, and this is something we talk about as care providers all the time, and it can be hard to get going, especially with a little one at home, but Mm -hmm. exercise. We want people to aim for about 150 minutes of cardiovascular and strength training a week. That's together, not 150 of one and 150 of other. That is a lot. So we're talking about 20 to 30 minutes a day. And if you think about it in that way, it's a little bit more approachable. So this can seem super overwhelming to get started with. So if you need to start with five to 10 minutes a day and work up to it, that's amazing. Totally. The point is just really focus on getting started. The benefits of exercise will also be huge on your Mm -hmm. mental health. And we know exercise helps to decrease risk of postpartum depression and the symptoms associated with it. So it's good for more than just your heart. Hey, totally. So here are some ideas of how to get started. So go for a walk for one of your baby's naps. We all know that those wee ones can be hard to nap in their own crib. So put them in their stroller or put them in a baby carrier and take them out for a walk to help them sleep. And then you can get a walk in. Bonus if you can coordinate this with a friend. So you also have some social interaction because it can be a really isolating time at home with that new baby. Mm -hmm. There are also a lot of great free YouTube fitness videos. One of our favorites is Fitness Blender, but there's tons out there. So just Googling that, just make sure that the person has some credentials behind them, Mm -hmm. I guess, so that they're guiding you appropriately. If you need a little bit more structure, try joining a class. Talk to your rec center or your local gym about a postpartum fitness class. They allow you to bring your baby and often incorporate them in the workout. This is also a great way to meet other people. Mm -hmm. We did a great podcast, number 79, with Robin Rayner from Tyrannus Mum Strong, and she talks about getting back into exercise after having a baby. And the title of that is Exercise During Pregnancy and Postpartum. So have a listen to that. And last but not least, if you listen to us or follow us regularly, you will know that one of us is Peloton (laughs) obsessed. That's me. Yeah. But no joke, there are some great guided walks, strength classes, core meditation, et cetera. And and some of those are actually pregnancy and postpartum specific. Yeah. And some of them are like five or 10 minutes. Totally. I do the 10 minute ones. Who has time for exercise? And you can do 10 minutes twice a day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be all together. Totally. So the next thing we can talk about is nutrition. Now, we will be talking about weight loss, but this point is more about what you are eating and the science of decreasing your long-term cardiovascular risk with the foods you consume. If you need clear-cut recommendations, have a look at the DASH, D-A-S-H, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, or the Mediterranean Diet. But the consensus is to emphasize whole grains, fruits and veggies, legumes, nuts, fish, poultry, and moderate dairy and heart-healthy oils, like avocado and olive oil. While doing this, decreasing consumption of refined grains, added sugars, trans fats, red, and processed meats. Now, we understand food and our relationship to it is extremely complex, and it can take a lot of work to change the patterns we've developed over years. And many people use food as a coping skill. They eat out of boredom. What does my husband call it? Food entertainment. Food entertainment. Food entertainment. It's true. Or, and we totally recognize that oftentimes people can't afford the foods that are healthy. So if you need some extra support around this, don't forget that many dietitians are covered by extended medical and that in British Columbia, we actually have free dietitian services for brief telephone advice that you can access by simply dialing 811. Now, number three is smoking. I think we're all aware of the health risks of smoking. However, smoking is hugely addictive, both because of the nicotine or whatever substance you're smoking, but also because of the habit Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so we know decreasing the amount that you're smoking, whatever you're smoking or vaping and ideally quitting has huge impact on our health. There's lots of resources out there that can help you in your journey. First of all, if you have a primary care provider, certainly reach out to your primary care provider for support around this. There's lots of medications that we can use and lots of techniques. A great online resource is Mm -hmm. quitnow.ca. They've got really good ideas and support around decreasing or quitting smoking. They've got some coaching around that. They've got some group supports. It's really quite an incredible resource. But one of the simplest ways that you can actually start on your journey is through mindful smoking cessation. So this technique can also be applied to food consumption as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you struggle with kind of that addictive habit of eating, use try this as well. But Generally speaking, it centers around being aware of why you are doing the things that you're doing. It's starting to notice why you do things and your thoughts and feelings in a curious and accepting manner. And by doing this, we may not react in the same way as we previously had. And then we can start to learn the thoughts or feelings that cause us to react in a certain way. 
i.e. smoking a cigarette, binge eating a tub of ice cream, and that we'll realize that those thoughts that we're reacting to will actually pass. Mm -hmm. So just start noticing why you're going for a cigarette or a joint or a vape. My lingo is not great. Sorry, team. And what are the feelings or thoughts that are triggering you to do so? Look at the package. What does it look like? How does it feel in your fingers? Starting to notice all of those sensations around the activity of smoking. What does it sound like? What does the vape pen smell like? What does the lighter or match sound like? and feel like when you use it? What does that first drag taste like? How does it make you feel? Be curious around if you need to finish it or if one drag was enough. So this technique can often help us recognize our triggers or habits, and by recognizing, we can start changing them or how we react to them. Mm, amen, sister. And I think you made a really good point that we have to remember it's not just smoking cigarettes, but smoking marijuana. So if you're gonna continue to use marijuana, try not smoking it, yeah. use it in a safer way. Okay, next up, bing, bing, boom, breastfeeding. So now we totally recognize that not everyone is able to or wants to breastfeed, and that is so okay. But we also know that there's good evidence around breastfeeding and decreasing diabetes, obesity, and long-term cardiovascular health. So we are going to speak to it. So there's good data that tells us if you breastfeed for longer than 12 months in your life, you will decrease your risk of developing type 2 diabetes, decrease your risk for obesity, and we think decrease your risk for coronary artery disease. Now, we don't know any studies around whether pumping and feeding your baby milk produces the same effect, but we would imagine it does. We also know that breastfeeding decreases your child's long-term risk of obesity and diabetes. So for those people who have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, it's important for us to have a conversation around the benefits of breastfeeding. So this next one is also a challenging one. I think will bring a lot of feelings to people, but Again, there's evidence around this. We need to speak to it. So aiming to be at your pre-pregnancy weight by about one year or 12 months postpartum is a really good goal. And we know that it actually decreases your risk of obesity and cardiovascular disease. Now, I think part of that is because to do that, generally speaking, we have to implement an active lifestyle and healthy food consumption. And so just by doing that, we're decreasing our risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Now, we're not asking people to get to an unrealistic BMI or weight just to aim to get back to what you were pre-pregnancy. And this is often easier said than done. So if you're struggling with this or need support, create a team around you. Reach out to a registered dietitian, have a fitness goal, hire a health coach if you're able to, get a friend who's on the same journey yeah. to be an accountability person. Whatever it needs to do to get some extra support around you, talk to your primary care provider. But this is a great goal for people. Not always easy to attain, but... Mm -hmm. And something else is considering future pregnancies. So this is number six. So we know that people who experienced complications in their pregnancy are at a higher risk of complications in any future pregnancies. So we really recommend talking to your care provider about how you can reduce that risk in between pregnancies, most of which will be following the topics and recommendations we just discussed, but also in any subsequent pregnancy. The advice will include taking aspirin starting between 12 to 16 weeks, being at a healthy pre-pregnancy body mass index, and perhaps being followed by an obstetrical specialist, depending on the severity of the complications that you had in your first pregnancy. And that also depends on the community in which you're living in. Totally. Yeah. So last but not least is long-term screening. This is when your friendly primary care provider comes in to support you. So some people should be followed by specialists due to severe complications of pregnancy. So these are the people who went into heart failure in pregnancy or have had heart valve issues or structural abnormalities of their heart, abnormal heart rate issues such as atrial fibrillation. But most follow-up for the vast majority of people having experienced these complications can and should be done with your family doctor or nurse practitioner. Now, in our community, unfortunately, many people do not have one of these, and so it's important for you to know what you should be screened for and advocate for that at a walk-in clinic or virtual health platform. We generally recommend at approximately six months postpartum, you should have a blood pressure, height, and weight check, as well as some blood work done. This would include doing a sugar screen, a cholesterol screen, and a kidney screen. We then use this information to calculate a risk score for long-term cardiovascular health. We'll attach it here so you can use it if you like. If any levels at six months were abnormal, we should repeat them again about one year postpartum. At this point, if you have not reached your pre-pregnancy weight, we would also recommend seeking the help of a registered dietitian, fitness counselor, health coach, etc., to help work with you on this. If there are still ongoing abnormalities, managing these with your primary care provider, if they are comfortable and capable, 
or getting a referral to a cardiologist or internal medicine specialist would be totally appropriate. Now, if everything has come back within normal range, then we would recommend screening the above measures that we covered, sugars, cholesterol, kidneys, blood pressure, about every one to three years ongoing, and for you to monitor your blood pressure pretty regularly at home. And most blood pressure cuffs are uh, covered by extended med- medical. So if you yep. do have extended benefits, it never hurts to have one at your house. So that was a lot of information. So let's just do a recap of the big take-homes. Number one, pregnancy is a stress test and can help us recognize some per- potential future health risks. And we can use this as an opportunity to make changes in our lives that will have a huge impact on our future health. Number two, if you suffered from hypertensive disorders of pregnancy or gestational diabetes, Make sure you incorporate physical activity, good nutritional choices, smoking cessation, breastfeeding if possible, and work on getting back to your pre-pregnancy weight by about one year postpartum. Number three, if you're planning on having pregnancies again in the future, make sure to talk to your care provider about how to reduce the risk in the next pregnancy. And number four, don't forget to talk to your long-term care provider about ongoing screening every one to three years and early intervention if there are any abnormalities. So we hope this is helpful and we know that this can be scary stuff, but it actually affects Mm -hmm. a huge amount of our population. And if we can start helping prevent this down the long term, we'll have a huge impact. And just normalize this conversation. Totally. Women's health matters. Sure does, buddy. Boom. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.